became a human being for all human beings, that he did not make any distinction between other human beings among themselves. Yes, the response to their freedom is different, but Christ wants everybody to be saved. This should be our attitude. Yes, we do have special relations, but then we are open to all human beings, as Christ is. The mystery of Christmas is the generation, is the birth of a human being that is the model for all human beings, is the fulfillment of the purpose of God, which was hidden before all creation. Let me read a little bit now uh, to see how uh, St. Athanasius has done a summary of why God became man in his writing. I've drawn some basic lines. Uh, I hope I jumped about, I went to heaven, I went to the angels, to other things, the inner man, the outer man, and so on. Let's see in a more orderly way how St. Athanasius has put it uh, in his uh, great work. Let's see the time we finish at. 12.30. 12.30. There is a famous statement that we find in the beginning of his great treatise, which says, God became human, that we human beings might become God's. That's a very famous statement, which is associated with St. Athanasius. The incarnation of God, then, is the foundation of Christian anthropology, of understanding the human being from a Christian point of view. Christ is the Son of God who became man to save humanity and to fulfill its original destiny. Athanasius' treatise on the Incarnation is the first paragraph in a profound exposition of the event of Christ. It is a continuation of another work against paganism, in other words, the worship of the universe, and the worship of all things in the universe, including the human being. The subject matter of which is summarized in the beginning of this second volume on the Incarnation. This work deals with the problem of idolatry, man's attachment to the world, what we call today secularism. Because we think that we're here to live forever. And we think that the universe, the food we drink, the air we breathe, all the things that we enjoy in this universe are the basis of our eternal existence. No, because they're not. The basis of our eternal existence is beyond the world. And the world's existence is also beyond the world. The world is not closed in itself. It doesn't have resources in itself. But the world is open to God, to the energies of God. And God provides for it. Creation is not something like the creations that we. We make uh, something, whatever we make. It's a house, like this beautiful house. It's a car, whatever many things the human being has made. But can they survive on their own unless we feed them, unless we care for them, unless we continue uh, preserving them in all kinds of ways? No, they cannot. So creation, so the human being. We rely on the continuing care of God. The fathers call this divine providence, which is really a promia. God has taken, uh, before he created the world, has also established a method for its renewal and preservation. Care for it. And Christ, of course, said it in so many simple ways to the people. When he said, look at the birds, look at the flowers, look at the grass, look at all the things, how they die and they come up again. There is a providence in everything that exists. Look at the generations of things. And all these things have been done in a way that man may understand that the world doesn't rely on itself, but on the powers of the grace of God, the powers of his providence. So, St. Athanasius discusses all these things very beautifully in this writing, which of course is in print, and you could easily read the details, but I want to give you uh, the main points from it. So, the substance of the problem, uh, why man turned to the world, as if the world is the basis of man's existence. As if the world has everything that man needs in order to exist. The substance was that he lost the real understanding of himself, who he is. That he was made rational in the image of the divine laws. Interesting, in the Greek language, the word, in the beginning was the word, 
you know, we find in the Gospel of John. The word there is the logos. And logos means logic, means reason, but also it means more than that. So God's reason is God's Son. The logos of God and the Son of God are two concepts that we bring together. In other words, in the spiritual existence of God, uh, the Son of God is His reason. But reason is not like human reason because we are only in the image of the laws of God. Um, so man was made self-conscious. That means logikos, made in the image of the divine laws. And that the world does not have an independent logic of its own apart from the uncreated energies, powers of the creator of laws who sustains everything and especially the human being who is the one that communicates with God more than anything else. Because God cares for the other things, but man has a freedom freely to communicate with God and therefore is much more perfect as a being that opens up the world and communicates with God. You might say, he is the pinnacle of creation. That is the order of things. The consequences of this problem that man turned inside to himself uh, have to do with man's existence and self-consciousness and knowledge. Man's existence is subjected to corruption and death, and man's knowledge is alienated from the truth of the world and the vision of God. Little by little, he turned to things uh, created, and he forgot who God is and did not communicate with God. People don't know God, they don't communicate with him. Athanasius maintains that the Christian reply to this problem and its fatal consequences is man's rediscovery of this principle, the Son of God, through whom all things were made. The Son of God who was revealed as a man, finally, because man could not rediscover him who was the creator, or who was the very image of God. So he became human that we may see him, and he entered into our history. He humbled himself, took the form of a servant of humanity, became a human being. So it is through him then that we may rediscover who we are in relation to Him. And that opens up ourselves, and through ourselves opens up the whole world to God. This writing on the Incarnation is divided into two main parts. The first one dealing with the meaning of the Incarnation, and the second is the objections raised by philosophers, by Jews, who, why did they reject the word, the, the Christ? Uh, the Jews have been prepared more than other nations, and yet they couldn't understand the mystery of the Incarnation. It was too big to realize. They expected a prophet. They expected a Messiah who was human. But not God becoming human. This was too much to believe in. And in fact, they were offended. Religiously, they said, who does he think he is? The Son of God? He made himself the Son of God, but he is like us. But that is exactly the grace of God, that he became exactly like us, and yet unlike us, in the way he thought, the way he used his powers, the way he lived his life, he was, as we say, the sinless one. How could he be sinless in the midst of a situation that was sinful? Many times we find ourselves in situations which are corrupt, and we say, how can we remain uncorrupt in this situation? We are all involved in all kinds of things. Sometimes we don't even know. And many times when we know it, we can't get out of it because of the nexus within which our uh, communal relations bring us. So Christ was in all this without actually being drawn by it. And that is the mystery of the presence of God and the grace of God in our midst. That's why the gospel is the greatest of all things that we have. The fathers taught us that when you take the Bible, you cannot just start from the beginning. The Bible is like a uh, pyramid. And on the top of the pyramid is the Gospel. We actually divide the Bible into three parts. We have the Gospel, which is on the altar. We don't have the Bible on the altar. Uh, the Old Testament is the preparation for the Gospel. It's, it gives us many types, preparing people for what God is doing in his care for the world. And so when it comes, Christ actually fulfilled the scriptures. 
and many of the things that he did, he could have done many other things, but he didn't, because he had to fulfill what had already been given, that the word of the scripture might be fulfilled. We read it all the time in the gospel. Uh, he actually told his disciples that they could do greater things because he had fulfilled all the things that had to be done, and now if you believe in him and you receive the power of God and the grace of God, you can do greater things. The third part, so the Old Testament is prophecy. The New Testament is the apostles, the apostles, the epistles. Beginning with the actual the apostles, right? And the gospel begins with the gospel of St. John, as we have it on the altar. Not as it is printed in the printed Bibles. This, this is interesting things to see what is the order of understanding the scriptures, which is primary, which is secondary, but they are all important because the whole scripture is a unit. The Old Testament, the preparation, the New Testament, the fulfillment, but the pinnacle of it all is the Holy Gospel. And the Holy Gospel is Christ, and Christ is the one who brings God and man together. And if man is the pinnacle of creation, then God has become man to restore his creation. That is the message of Christmas. So, he became man. The event of the incarnation, the biggest thing that ever happened in the history of the world. St. Athanasius tells us that when God was thinking to create the world, he laid his word, the Son, as the foundation for it. So that if everything went wrong, he would come to our rescue. Where does he get this uh, thought from? From St. Paul in the Epistle of the Ephesians. There is this statement at the beginning of the Epistle of the Ephesians. Actually, most of all the things that the Fathers say come from St. Paul, who was a tremendous theologian. He was one of the apostles, yet not like them who lived with Christ all the time. He was the one who persecuted the Christian movement and to whom Christ appeared. I had the, the single privilege of going to Damascus, where he was baptized. And I went on the way to Damascus, where he went. I can't even describe it, because I will be in tears before you. It was a very moving experience, because I go and teach in Balamant in uh, Lebanon. Uh, and one day, I was taken by car from the northern part of Lebanon to, into Syria, and all the way to Damascus. It was an extraordinary experience, in the way it was. And, uh, I felt that I was following the steps of St. Paul. And I was taken to the place where he was blinded when Christ appeared to him. But when he was baptized, his eyes were opened and restored. So it is St. Paul actually, the Epistle of the Ephesians, who was taught by Christ direct, who said to us that he predestined us in him before the foundation of the world. In other words, that our destiny was hidden with Christ before our creation. And this was revealed at the incarnation. Christmas then is the event that